Hello there and welcome to my YouTube channel. Today uh, I've just put together this very short film about Lawrence of Arabia and the reason for my interest was that um, a friend of mine, Keith Makepeace, uh, suggested that Lawrence stayed in Thurlston and South Milton during his service when he was at RAF Mountbatten. Now, Lawrence uh, joined the Marine Branch of uh, at RAF Mountbatten in 1925 and he used to holiday up around South Milton and Thurlstone uh, in the very, very early 1930s. Now we're flying down over Thurlstone village. Uh, this was filmed um, just last year, 2020, and um, we're going to fly just around on the edge of the coast and uh, I'm going to try and point out the house, which is called Savasnaig, uh, which is down on Thurlston Sands and uh, has a tremendous view overlooking uh, South Milton Sands and uh, the Thurlston Rock. Uh, there's also some uh, photographs taken of Lawrence uh, when he was sitting uh, on the front terrace of this particular house. And there's even a plaque uh, dated uh, 1932 when he was a guest at, uh, at the property and uh, as we come around the coast here now we've got uh, below uh, Thurlston Golf Club which of course would have been there very much so in the early 1930s and we're just uh, flying across the, the beach and the house is uh, the house that Lawrence stayed in is pictured here and, th and this just sits back from the beach on the uh, very very edge of Thurlston village and this is uh, just just coming out over Thelson Golf Course now. And here's a photograph of Lawrence sitting on the porch on the terrace of that house back in uh, 1932. So I thought it was interesting to, to try and make this film. It's a very, very short film and can only, can't really do justice to the whole of his life, but it's just a snippet of what he was doing in the early 1930s. During the war, he organized and led the Arabs of the desert in their revolt against the Turks whom the British forces were fighting in Palestine. As an archaeologist in the Near East, this young Oxford Don had become familiar with the language, life and character of the nomad tribes. When the Arab revolt began, Lawrence was sent to act as a link with these highly irregular allies. On their fast camels, the desert raiders were a dangerous threat to the Turkish line of communications. And under Lawrence's daring leadership, they constantly attacked and disorganized the enemy. The Arab commander, the Emir Faisal, son of the Sheriff of Mecca, gave Lawrence his entire confidence. In this, the only cinema film ever taken showing Lawrence at the front, we see him barefooted and wearing Arab robes. He stands with hands clasped on the Emir's left, interpreting a conversation with a British officer who also wears an Arab headdress. This revolt in the desert reached its climax in the capture of Damascus. It had been Lawrence's great ambition to set up an Arab empire under his friend Faisal. The refusal of the Allied governments to carry out this plan greatly embittered him. After serving in the Royal Air Force under the name of Shaw, he retired to this little cottage lost amid the Devonshire Moors. Here is Pat Noe. While uh, Lawrence was uh, working at the Marine Branch in uh, RF Mountbatten in the early 30s, he was very much involved with the uh, development of the RAF launch, which became the ST-200. And later they developed from that the SLL-100. Now, these vessels saved over 13,000 airmen from drowning in the English Channel during the war. So I think it was... Uh, quite a tremendous development and an amazing achievement that the uh, that Lawrence could help uh, develop these uh, very fast air sea rescue boats to go out and rescue the airmen. Lawrence was very popular with the Bedouins because he uh, imitated their own ways. He lived with them as one of them and he ate the food they ate, he rode the camels as they rode distances as much as they did uh, so they liked him, they admired him, they uh, thought that he was their friend. 
But even as he rode north with the gathering tribes, Lawrence was becoming more and more distressed by the growing trust the Arab leaders had placed in his word. For by now, he had discovered the Allies' plan to divide the Middle East. Not being a perfect fool, I could see that if we won the war, the promises to the Arabs were dead paper. Had I been an honorable advisor, I would have sent my men home and not let them risk their lives for such stuff. Yet the Arab inspiration was our main tool in winning the Eastern War. So I assured them that England kept her word in letter and spirit. In this comfort, they performed their fine things. But of course, instead of being proud of what we did together, I was continually and bitterly ashamed. You're dealing with somebody who came from a very moral background, a very Christian upbringing, who had a very high set of standards, who taught at Sunday school, who had a very strong sense of his personal integrity. And you put him into a position which is absolutely appalling from the moral point of view. In a message to Cairo, which he drafted and then withdrew, he wrote, I've decided to go off alone to Damascus, hoping to get killed on the way. For all sakes, try to clear this show up. The next objective was the vital port of Aqaba at the northern end of the Red Sea. The Turkish fortress there had been under bombardment from British and French warships, but the bulk of the Turkish forces were in the hills behind the town. Lawrence, with Auda and two other Arab leaders, rode in a great loop through the desert, heading for the heights above Aqaba. They gathered a force of 500 men as they went, and on the journey, Lawrence himself took these photographs. It was a long and arduous ride through a waterless desert. It took two months to reach their objective. Lawrence took pride always in describing how he kept up with his Arab companions, but it is known that during these journeys, he suffered from recurrent bouts of malaria and dysentery, and from infected sores on his body. So long as he gave us the other 999 thousandths of the Arab world. The soldier who recorded these careful accounts of military tactics was still a scholar, one who'd always dreamed of writing an epic work. Now, in the revolt, Lawrence was surrounded by finer subject matter than he could have dreamed of. The story I have to tell, he said later to a friend, is one of the most splendid ever given a man for writing. By September 1917, he'd begun making notes for the book on army message pads. They were descriptive rather than military, since there was always a risk they might fall into enemy hands. In the Dirar experience of 1917 had left more than physical wounds. He wrote movingly about it in the course of a long and intense correspondence with Bernard Shaw's wife, Charlotte. And the exercise of my not contemptible wits and talents. Lawrence detested the army and campaigned hard to be readmitted into the RAF. Finally, after going so far as virtually to threaten suicide, he was allowed back. The ten years that followed brought him a remarkable contentment. But when the RAF posted him to India in 1926, the rumors began to grow that he was there for some diplomatic purpose, perhaps even a cloak and dagger operation. Both the press and the public continued to see him as a buccanesque adventurer resolving exotic problems in far places on behalf of the empire. In fact, he was, in his own words, doing a perambulating clerkly job. He worked in the engine repair depot at Karachi. He'd always had a natural aptitude for mechanics. And in his spare time, he was engaged in nothing more sinister than the translation of Homer's Odyssey. But back home, the newspaper stories multiplied. And when there was a rebellion in Afghanistan in 1928, one paper trumped up a story that Lawrence was behind it. Again, his presence had become an embarrassment, and he was rushed back to England. It was this arrival by sea that was so effectively ambushed by the press and the newsreels. I'm being hunted and don't like it. When the cry dies down, I'll come out of my hole and see people. These home movies are from the late 20s. Here he's with the American publisher, F.N. Doubleday. They'd met in Paris, and Doubleday wrote that Lawrence was one of the most brilliant conversationalists he ever met. They became firm friends. And these shots of Lawrence in a speedboat, 
not just rest and recreation. As a designer and mechanic, he played a vital role in developing high-speed launches for use in air-sea rescue work. He involved himself in this after seeing the nine-man crew of a flying boat drown when the plane crashed into the sea. There were those, like Churchill, who hoped he might continue to serve the nation, as Churchill said, in these troubled times. This uh, that crashed in uh, Plymouth Sound, and uh, which Lawrence was involved in trying to rescue the crew uh, in the uh, in the 1920s. This is RAF Mountbatten after suffering some bomb damage during uh, the early 1940s, where um, in previous years, uh, T. E. Lawrence, uh, under the name of uh, T. E. Shaw, had been based while he was uh, working with the RAF. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this brief, and I say brief, it's a really brief look at what uh, Lawrence of Arabia was doing in the uh, 1920s and very early 1930s down here in Plymouth at RAF Mountbatten. And uh, please have a consider of uh, subscribing to my channel because uh, I really enjoy putting this sort of historical uh, bits and pieces together and I would appreciate your support and uh, take the greatest care. All the very best. Cheers for now.